am the director for the Friends of Neath Hearts Bay Watershed Estuary Beach and Sea, which we affectionately abbreviate to WEBS. Um, we're excited you're joining us tonight for this WEBS and also Explore Nature listed event, Birds Birding on the Bay. Uh, this is a series we do every year. And uh, tonight we're bringing you a new installment, Birds of Prey. Which, um, so just to tell you a little bit about who we are, the Friends of Neatars Bay Webs works to sustain the Neatars Bay area through education and stewardship. We engage youth and the general public um, around local watersheds, estuaries, beaches, and seas, providing rich learning opportunities like tonight, um, as well as ways to engage in community science projects so that we can all learn more about this place together and stewardship activities. Um, we utilize funding from grants and generous private donations. Um, and as a result, we're able to offer our programs for free to schools and the public, reducing barriers to participation. So in a moment here, I'm gonna hand it over to Ram, our presenter for tonight. Um, he has offered a number of programs with us as I've already mentioned. Ram describes himself as a professional bird enthusiast, uh, working to combine his education in fine arts with his experiences working as a field biologist to create artistic and accurate wildlife images. He has 20 plus, plus seasons as a uh, doing, doing bird research as well as research on other wildlife. So thanks again, Ram, for joining us. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight. It's, it's just really great to have this nice audience. And I know a big part of that is our topic. Um, birds of prey are very popular. They are birds that not just bird people like, but pretty much everybody likes birds of prey or at least has some level of interest in them. So for me, let's see here. Okay, that's advancing now. Um, I was just starting to become interested in, in birds in, in seventh grade, and that was in 1985. And at that time, I saw this far side cartoon. Um, I don't know if you, if some of you are familiar with this one, but for me, it's a classic. We have the birds of prey there in the tree and the caption is, birds of prey know they're cool. And I must say that this uh, little cartoon here had quite an impression on me. And, uh, you know, uh, throughout the years, whenever I've had a really good look at a raptor, I stop and think to myself, that bird knows it's cool. So this uh, cartoon here is always in the back of my mind and I hope it will be for you going forward. Uh, but like I was saying, uh, birds of prey uh, have a very wide appeal uh, because they're fantastic birds. Uh, they're, here we have the peregrine falcon, the, the fastest bird in the world. You know, it's, it, it's clocked at 240 miles an hour in a dive. Um, so they have speed and power. Here's a, a ferruginous hawk that's uh, found in eastern Oregon, a big, powerful hawk. Uh, birds of prey are, are beautiful and, and graceful. Look at, the, look at the long legs on this one. Okay, come over here, Don. You got to see this. Okay. Um, uh, birds of prey also exhibit uh, interesting behaviors. Here's a, a pair of Harris's hawks. This is a species found in the Southwest United States that um, kind of hunts in, uh, in, in packs like wolves. And look at those birds, they're beautiful. Um, here's one of the smallest raptors in the world, uh, the white collared falconet of Southeast Asia. And here's the pygmy falcon of Africa. Uh, this bird is just not that much larger than a sparrow, really. Here's a, a tawny eagle from Africa, another large, powerful raptor. Here we have uh, the secretary bird of Africa, the African savanna. And uh, look at those legs. Is that, is that something? Uh, it, it uses those to walk through tall grasses uh, in search of his prey uh, across the savannas of Africa. And here's one of my wife's favorite, the Harrier Hawk. Um, it is adapted to uh, 
probe into cavities to grab nestlings out. You can see it has these long legs and it reaches into the cavities. It's very nimble. See how it just effortlessly hangs uh, from this branch and accesses the prey within. Oh, okay, so yeah, we observed them in Africa uh, trying to uh, feed on lovebirds that were in nest cavities. And uh, that was endlessly amusing. Here we have Johnny Rook from the Falkland Islands. Uh, this bird, as you see here, likes to extend out its wings and just run, sprint along the ground. Uh, very interesting behavior. But this species also scratches in the, in the ground, in the intertidal zone, like a chicken. Here we have it, scratch, scratch, look up, scratch, scratch, just like a chicken. So we'll go through all the raptors of the Oregon coast and the Neaparts Bay area. And we will also touch on owls at the end of the program, which are also considered raptors and also fantastic and very popular, just like the other birds of prey. These are a couple of jungle owlets from India. And here's one of the largest owls in the world. Uh, what's this one? Rose Eagle Owl. You know why I think about that? I'm on those eyelids. Pink on there? It's beautiful. Oh, my wife asked me who took these pictures. I took all the ones we've seen here and most of the images throughout the program tonight. Uh, my friend Roy Lowe also contributed some. And there's um, some also that I didn't take from the internet that I can point out as well. But I took most of them, okay? Is that good enough? Yeah. All right. So we'll start tonight's program looking at exhibitors. So along the Oregon coast here, we have three species of exhibitors, uh, the sharp-shinned hawk, cooper's hawk, and goshawk. And these are uh, forest raptors. They have uh, rather short wings and long tails, which then enables them to maneuver in tight spaces and zoom through the, the trees and branches in the forest in pursuit of prey. And their prey is usually birds. So um, when we were putting this program together, I was asked to include some identification information. So I thought I'd just start with one of the toughest um, ID conundrums among the birds of prey along the coast here. And that is uh, comparing sharp-shinned hawk to Cooper's hawk. The one pictured here is a Cooper's hawk. And here's a sharp-shinned hawk. So um, let, let me just not sugarcoat this, okay? It is difficult to tell these two species apart. And uh, there's no way around it. it, it it's difficult. And uh, it has been for me for quite a few years. And one of the things growing up back after I saw that far side cartoon, I was just starting to look at raptors. And uh, I was told to look at the tail. And uh, the sharp shinned hawk would have a square tail. Uh, the bottom would be flat across. And so for 20 years, I looked at the tails on sharp shinned hawk and Cooper's hawk. Now tell me, is that square to you? We're looking right down here. Now, uh, the adults, it's a little bit more straight across than this is a, this is a uh, first year bird. So it's, but still that's, that's tough to me. And so, uh, you know, here's another look at that tail. I'm not sure that that's square. Don, is that square? No. no. It's different. It's not that great a field mark, and I've driven myself crazy over the years trying to figure out if it. Okay, this looks even less square. Okay, that just looks rounded to me. But this is a sharp shinned hawk. So let's just move past the squared off tail. And what I want you to look at on this bird is the streaking on the breast and belly. You see, to me, this is the field mark that you want to look at on the juvenile birds, okay? These are hatchier birds. These were birds that were born last spring. And that's mostly what we see in our yards along the coast. And I think that just speculating, um, that may be because they're, you know, focused in on um, 
bird feeders. They're looking for that easy prey. And that's why they're, we see so many juveniles. But also, they're just maybe more in air. So we're going to look here at two uh, hatchier birds, two juveniles. And, okay, so this bird on the left is the Cooper's hawk. And the bird on the right is the sharp shinned hawk. Now, if you look at this, look at the difference in the streaking there. The Cooper's hawk has very dark, thin streaks on the breast. And the sharp shinned hawk has these wider, softer, rufous brown streaks. Now, this isn't that hard to tell these apart. This isn't too bad. So that's what you got to focus on, folks. You're going to get the vast majority of birds in your yard are going to be these first year birds. And this is what you want to look at. I'm telling you, believe me on this one. It's great. Forget the tail. Okay. So what's this? Come on, Don. You, you can yell it sharp. Okay. We're going to have to back this up here. <laughs> the Coopers has the uh, thin, dark stripes. Uh, the like sharp that. shint has the wider oh, rufous Coopers. stripes. Sorry. So this is a Cooper's hawk. Yes. yes. Okay. You were no help at all on that. Okay. But I think the audience here has got that one down and it's a good one to remember here. This one. Hey, Ram, can um, I interject for just a oh, second? Yeah. The angle of the screen off? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, your, your audio got a little choppy on us. Do you think you might be able to try that headphone set out after all? These pictures oh, are fabulous. Oh, this is even better here. It's like I'm a tour guide again. <laughs> so we're, how's, this, how's the audio now? Is that better? Ah, uh, that sounds pretty good. Let's give that a try. Thank you for doing that. Sorry to interrupt your flow. This is, these pictures are amazing, by the way. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, these, these pictures right here, the, the last few, these were all taken right in our yard here. Um, so. Okay, this is another sharp shin in here. Here you go. Look at the pale, nice rufous streaks on the breast. No problem. And here's another sharp shin hawk. Now that one, this is an adult here. What? Okay. Um, okay, so moving right along. Here's another picture. Now this one. This is an adult, okay? So we don't have the streaks on the breast. The coloration on the, the, the upper parts and back on the sharp shin and Cooper's hawk are very similar. So we're not gonna use that. But this, this picture right here, this is a very difficult ID here. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you folks. This is not easy and don't let anyone tell you it is, okay? So looking at this, um, the sharp shin hawk has a small beak compared to the larger beak on the Coopers, okay? This is the Coopers. Yeah, okay, that has a larger beak. There's the sharp shin. Yeah, that's smaller. This is exactly in between. And the eye on the sharp shin hawk is supposed to be bigger. Well, it's, I don't know. Is that bigger than this? I, that, that looks like a terrible field mark. Forget about it. Uh, the, the Cooper's hawk is supposed to have a dark hood on it and a, a, and a paler nape. What's that? No, no, I'm not telling them yet. I'm going over the field marks. Okay, so then um, I can't really tell on this bird. And then, so the sharp shinned hawk has the, the thinner legs and the Cooper's hawk has the thicker legs. So I, you can't, I don't know, it's exactly in between. I'm telling you. Okay. Um, and then, of course, there's the size difference. The Cooper's hawk is larger. The sharp shinned hawk is smaller. But there is a zone of overlap. Uh, the females are the larger birds in raptors. I should mention that. And the uh, male Cooper's hawk is about overlapping in size with the female uh, uh, sharp shinned. Okay. I, so, anyway. The bottom line is this is very hard to tell. And the way that, you know, I was talking to Steve Holzman, who's a raptor expert ahead of this uh, program here. And what, how we finally determine what this is, is by the length of the middle toe. Okay. You heard me right. The sharp shinned hawk has an exceptionally large 
middle toe. So that's how we were able to determine that this is a sharp shinned hawk. So <laughs> I can hear everyone in the audience now, honey, this guy just told me I got to see the length of the inner toe on this bird to identify it. <laughs> it's crazy. But that's so if you're having trouble identifying the adult Coopers, I feel your pain. And this Cooper's hawk is also misidentifying this bird here as a real pileated woodpecker. So don't feel bad. Even the hawk can't tell the difference between things sometimes. And they, and they got the eagle eyes, you understand. Okay, so one thing I wanted to address before we move on here is that um, a lot of people who have sharp shinned hawks like this one in their yard um, observe them attacking the birds at their feeders. And this can be very upsetting for people. Um, and they wanna know what to do about this. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it to, to prevent the, the Sharpies or Cooper's hawks from uh, attacking your feeder. But I did wanna bring up that right now there is a, a salmonella outbreak along the Oregon coast. And um, it's actually uh, useful to have birds of prey knock off or eliminate the sick birds so that the pathogen isn't spread to other individuals. So if you wanna look at the bright side of it, uh, keep that in mind. Just a couple uh, finishing up with the uh, excipiters here, a couple of shots. Now that's definitely a sharp shinned hawk. You can see the very thin, uh, legs on that bird and the small head and of course those streaks and just one last look at a, a young sharp shinned hawk we'll move on to a different group of raptors called the bootios now look at the coloration on this uh, this is a red shouldered hawk uh, the coloration is actually very similar to a sharp shinned hawk uh, you know it's got this uh, dark and light stripes and the tail and wing and those rufous underparts. But if you look at this rough legged hawk, its tail is, what's that? I'm sorry, uh, red shouldered hawk. Hey, you got me there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the tail is much shorter on this red shouldered hawk. And um, Budios in general are very thick, heavy bodied raptors. Here's a, that's a, this is a painting that I did. And then this is the interpretive panel that I did with that painting. This is down in, uh, in at the Bandon Marsh National Wildlife Refuge. So interestingly, back in 1985, it was a big year for me, Don. I saw the, that um, far side cartoon and I saw my first red shouldered hawk at Fern Ridge Reservoir on the Christmas bird count. Now back then seeing a red shouldered hawk in Oregon was a big deal. You'd call everyone up and have everyone come out and, and see the bird. Uh, but now they're actually quite common, um, especially in the southern part of the state and along the coast. So they've had a range expansion into Oregon coming up from the south, uh, even though across the country, their numbers are diminishing, that range is extending into Oregon. And um, I'm rather happy about it. Okay, so th these pictures were taken in our yard where we have a lot of red-shouldered hawks and um, they've been attempting to breed, which is very interesting because that'd be the first um, uh, successful breeding attempt in Lincoln County if they're able to do that. But I know these birds do also extend up the coast to the Neetarts Bay area. Just a couple more red-shouldered hawks from our yard. Okay, they um, prefer areas, if you wanna to try to find one, along water routes. They like swampy areas, areas along sloughs and they eat a lot of frogs and snakes, amphibians. Uh, that's the tendency for the uh, red-shouldered hawks. Okay, so now I wanna compare red-shouldered hawk to the very common uh, red-tailed hawk. So this is a red-tailed hawk, ignore the tail. What I want you to look at are the white areas on the back on these feathers here, okay? And I know that you're saying, oh, well, you can just look at the tail, but sometimes if you have a, uh, a young bird, 
that doesn't have a red tail yet, they still have these uh, white feathers on the back here on both sides. And believe me, this is incredibly useful. Here they are. There's an arrow pointing to them. Now let's bring up that red shouldered hawk. Here we go. I, and I know what you're thinking. Okay, this one's got like white spots on there too. Uh, white edges and all this, but not in that particular area of the back. Those are called, what are those, the scapulars? Yeah. Um, so this is uh, actually amazingly useful. I mean, it doesn't seem like it in this picture. I know you're not buying it, but you can just, if you see the birds from behind, you can identify them by this, even if you're speeding down the freeway. Okay. All right, now here's the other side of these birds. We have the uh, red-tailed hawk on the left. And what I want you to look at here is the belly band. There, this area, it's light underneath, but red-tailed hawks have that band of darker feathers across the belly. This is also extremely useful and easy to spot as you're flying down the freeway. Okay, and well, you saw that that was the, um, you know, the, the red-shouldered hawk adult obviously doesn't have a belly band. It has got that rufous on the, the front parts, under parts. But here is a, a young red-shouldered hawk and it's streaky, kind of like the red tail, but you see it, it doesn't have that belly band, doesn't have the pale breast and the modeling underneath. So take a good look at that. Now in flight, Oh boy, I, I wanted to give the, the toughest situation. So we have kind of a weird looking uh, red-tailed hawk uh, here on the left and on the right, we have a, um, a, a uh, red shoulder hawk. These are both uh, hatchier birds, both juveniles. So what I want you to look at is the front edge of the wing on the red-tailed hawk. It always has these black areas on the forewing and the red shouldered hawk never has those. So, so that's what I want you to key on when you see a uh, Budio in flight. Now, here we go again. Here's the classic red tail. It's got the red tail, but what I want you to look at is that dark area on the wing. Okay. Huh. This is a very unusual dark morph uh, red tailed hawk that I just threw in to, to show you. Moving on here, we have the uh, rough-legged hawk. Uh, this is a, a bird that is more common in the valley, but it does show up in open areas along the coast here. Um, it is a migratory bird that uh, actually breeds up on the tundra and just spends the winter down here, unlike those other two species I showed earlier. So what you want to look at on these are these black patches on the underwing. Okay, nothing else has those. Um, this, this species of raptor also has a, a habit of hovering when it, it hunts. So this bird, particular bird is hovering and you can see those, uh, yeah, <laughs> big black patches that almost look like false eyes, uh, my wife just pointed out. So um, they feed on small, uh, small mammals here and, uh, on their northern breeding ground. So just a little personal side note here. I found this nest on an island um, in Alaska in the Samiti Islands. And uh, my understanding is this is the furthest south uh, nest ever discovered in Alaska. And the, the folks at the wildlife refuge there were very excited to hear about this. So that's the nest up there. And we'll move on to look at kites, okay? And as everyone knows, the Oregon coast has lots of kites. Just pausing for laughter here. <laughs> okay, but we only have one species of raptor in the kite group, and that's this um, white-tailed kite. It's called, it used to be called black-shouldered kite. Uh, now it's called white-tailed kite. And it's fairly distinctive. You're not going to really confuse it with anything else. It's a, so we'll just move on to bald eagles. And um, 
you know, when you get visitors to the Oregon coast, everyone wants to tell you they saw a bald eagle. Oh, dear. We, we, we went traveling and we saw a bald eagle. You see, the visitors to the coast don't understand that this is a common bird here now. Uh, wasn't always the case, but now there are plenty of bald eagles around. And what I want to start with here is the comparison of the bald eagle to the golden eagle. And uh, amongst the adults, it's a pretty easy uh, identification. But um, with the younger birds of both of these species, it's a little harder to tell them apart. So let's why, take... Why you do that? Do you get golden uh, we, we get golden eagles on the coast occasionally. Most what? Yeah, okay, so that's a good point. My wife's making the point that when people see an eagle that doesn't have a white head, they jump to the conclusion that it is a golden eagle, but that's not the case as we're going to look at now. All right. So here's, um, and here we're looking at younger birds. We have the bald eagle and the golden eagle here, as you see. Now, the key to telling them apart is where the white is on the bald eagle. They're, they have white modeling throughout the body and uh, on the wings and breast. But on the golden eagle, that the white is um, isolated in just small patches and it's symmetrical on both sides and in, in a very orderly fashion. Here's a, a graphic I got off of the internet. And this shows, uh, you know, uh, over five years, the uh, birds maturing in the different plumages they have, but you can see on the golden eagle that white is always isolated on certain parts of the wing and not on the body. Okay. B3 and. Okay, what are you looking at here? B3 and what is this? An eye test? E O Q? Whatever. A couple of them look similar, but trust me on this. If it's modeled and it's a bald eagle. So, okay. I mentioned earlier, we had a bunch of photos from uh, my friend Roy Lowe, and we have several here with the, of bald eagles. And this is one of them. This is a bunch of what? Are these golden eagles? No, look, that white scattered all over the body there. Um, uh, so these are a group of young uh, bald eagles. And as you saw from that graphic, up to their fourth year, they have that modeling. Here's a better look at that. You can see the different patches of white mixed in with the dark feathering. Yeah. Okay, now this is really cool. Uh, now, most, most people also aren't aware that balls get a lot of their food from scavenging. So it's not quite as noble as getting the prey the old fashioned way. So here, this is, these are some great shots from Roy Lowe here. And these are from the Waldport Bridge, looking down at a, a harbor seal and her pup. And there's the bald eagle stealing that placenta. They're, they're good eating, I understand. Some yeah, that's right. I mean, that's even among humans, uh, sometimes this, whatever. Okay, so here, here's another great shot. Here's a couple of eagles fighting over that placenta. Yeah, this is in Waldport, yeah. And you can see the same thing in Etarts Bay. Um, but here, a couple, uh, are those, no, those are crows there. But uh, we're not identifying anything but birds of prey tonight, so. Okay, so uh, moving along here, I wanted to talk, uh, talk about the relationship between bald eagles and murres along our coast. So here, this is what the scene used to look like up at Cape Mears near you, you, you guys there at, in Neatarts Bay. So you had, um, what was it? It's Pyramid Rock and Pinnacle Rock, Pillar Rock used to be covered with MERS like you see in this photograph here. And okay, yeah, the, you know, uh, bald eagles got to eat. So they go in, they grab a MER there, but that's just the beginning of this story because um, they land on the colony and flush a lot of the birds, uh, all the murres off at of the top. You can see this one's getting a chick here. And here in this, in this photograph, you can see all them. It's clear in the whole top of that rock off. The murres are all doing a huge dread flight, it's called. Now, Don, did you notice this bald eagle's two fists in it here? It's got a chick in the talons and in the beak. Whew. I know this is tough stuff to watch here, but... 
it's also pretty exciting to see, even if it's tragic. And uh, this is just a gratuitous extra shot of that that I threw in. But okay, so you know, the, there are only so many eagles um, around to have an impact on these MERS. But what happens is, as soon as the MERS are scared off an area, the gulls and vulture, uh, vultures, especially gulls, react, crows and ravens come in too. But these um, Western gulls, are, you see the one flying away with an egg there? You see that? And so eventually these MERS keep getting scared off and what you have left is not much. Uh, there's just empty rock and here's a, an eagle saying, well, well, there used to be food every time I landed here. What's going on? <laughs> Okay, here's another very familiar bird all along the Oregon coast here. And this is a very widespread species. It's a, an osprey. And um, quite a few locations along the coast here. Um, PUDs have put up uh, and other uh, agencies have put up platforms for ospreys to nest on. This is a migratory species that uh, goes down to Mexico, South America during the winter and breeds in our area. This one's got a big sea perch. And uh, here's another shot of an osprey cruising along uh, the herring. Now these are pretty easy to identify. They, you know, if you maybe from far away or something, you just see the white head, you might at first think it's a bald eagle, but it's got a very distinct pattern on its wings and uh, way of holding its wings when it flies. Yeah, a lot of all white under parts, dark upper parts. Here's an osprey bringing some materials to the nest. This is a, next we have here an interesting situation that uh, Roy got some pictures of. And this is a, a bird that's dangling in the tree. I don't know if you can see that, but it's hanging by one leg by monofilament line. So um, some climbers went up and try, uh, rescued this bird. Just a, a reminder to, uh, dispose properly of your uh, fishing line. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to bring up is, this is not a mistake, this is supposed to be in the show. Okay, so this is going to surprise some folks watching, but the next group of uh, raptors and birds of prey that we're going to look at is actually closely related to this parrot than to hawks eagles, acceptors, any of those. It's really amazing. Um, what, oh, this is, this is one of our, we have a bunch of rescued parrots here at our house. This is, you want me to introduce the parrot? This is Congo. It's a uh, blue fronted Amazon. And here is Esme, a, uh, what is this? A white orange winged. Okay, so look at the face of this bird. Look at that beak. Okay, I want you to concentrate on that. And then look at this bird. So the reality is parrots and falcons are very closely related. Falcons are more closely related to parrots than all those other raptors we just looked at. Is this crazy stuff? And so this is an example of convergent evolution. I, 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 we, they way we know this is uh, DNA research for the most part. Back in um, 2014, um, there was a lot of new DNA evidence for various groups of birds. And the biggest shocker was this one with the parrots and the falcons. And we're loving it here. But the truth is, if you were familiar with this bird, it is very much like a bird of prey. They are, they can be very vicious and they go for meat. I'm telling you, and these birds are, just trust me, if you knew some parrots, you'd understand how they're closely related to falcons. So here's a peregrine falcon. Uh, this is a, a very widespread species um, all across the world. Their numbers were reduced due to DT. DDT in the 70s, but they've made a, a great comeback and they're not that hard to see along the Oregon coast. Here's a, a great shot of one in flight. And what we are looking at on these falcons as um, compared to those other birds that we, other birds of prey we've looked at are these sharp wings here. Look at the wings on this. Uh, so all the falcons have these uh, long tapered wings. We'll take a quick look at peregrine falcon 
versus Merlin here. Oh, hey, Don, you, no one would have noticed if you didn't point that out. Come on. Okay, here we have uh, Steve Holzman. He's joined us tonight. We got him in. And uh, he does a lot of raptor banding in Wisconsin. And here he is. I, I stole this picture off his Facebook page. <laughs> uh, we have a, a, you can see the Merlin is much smaller and uh, much smaller feet, even in uh, smaller talons compared to the body of the bird. And uh, there's the peregrine falcon, a very large, robust falcon with large feet. And here's a, a the, I got this graphic off the internet here. And what you want to look for um, on these birds, obviously the Merlin's much smaller, but it's the that really big dark mustache. So um, here's some shots of the uh, peregrine falcon in flight. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the world's fastest bird. Here it is in a, a stoop zooming along. Here's one, what, what, what did I say? Bird. I said that earlier. It's the world's fastest animal. You only limit it to birds here, but come on, what's going to be faster than a bird? Okay, so the, here's one in a stoop. And let me tell you, these are not easy shots to get. This thing's going 240 miles an hour. Well, this one's probably not going that fast, but you get the point. So that's a shot I took, and then this one's from Roy. Okay, so peregrine falcons mostly eat birds. And this one uh, has a Stellar's J. They're very opportunistic in their in what birds they take. They'll just take whatever they can catch. They don't seem to be that picky. Here's the peregrine plucking that um, Stellar's Jay. See the feathers flying through the air. So here's the deal. You have a bunch of uh, nests up in your area near Neetarts, Cape Mears, uh, Three Arch Rocks, Cape Lookout. You have a lot of nests around. So do we down here in Newport. We have a great eyrie at Yaquinahead Natural Area. And here's a shot of a pair mating right there in the parking lot of the visitor center. And let me tell you, I told you birds of prey are sexy birds, right? They're very popular and these birds have groupies. I'm telling you, you go there any day of the week, not just any given Sunday, any day, and you have a group of people there just hang out all morning watching these falcons. So that's the scene here, folks. Uh, here's the, uh, the result of the, 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 that mating activity. We have a young peregrine falcon being fed by its parents. And uh, here's uh, the adult flying away from the eyrie with the young downy chicks. Here are the chicks growing up. They still have a little bit of down on them. And here we can see they're almost fully feathered. They do have the blue color around the eye and on the sear of the beak, the base of the beak, um, differentiating them from the adults. They have the brownish plumage with the buffy edges. Uh -oh, those, have what color? Uh, the, the, those parts that are blue on this bird are yellow on the adult, as you see in this photo. Okay. And uh, so there's, blue. yeah, blue. And then they have a little bit tawnier under parts. Here's a shot of that eyrie from further away. It's on the wall of an old rock quarry and it's just a shelf in the rock. And you see, they've made quite a mess here, Don. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, the adults vigorously defend uh, their nest um, during that breeding season. And here, here's a shot from Roy of a, a gull being attacked by some uh, protective parents. Okay, here's that uh, young peregrine falcon testing its wings. And here it is fledged, okay? It's left the eyrie and it's on its own. And here's a shot from above showing that platform, the eyrie that the birds were on and some of the uh, remains. And just a few more shots of these beautiful chicks. Yeah, did I mention that I was one of the groupies that you went ahead? Yeah, no, I not as... Uh, not as men, I'm not there as often as a lot of people, but I, uh, it's a wonderful place to visit. Here's another shot of a young peregrine falcon. And then there's these classic shots of them frolicking. Yeah, there's three in this picture and they're just hanging out in this bed of, of uh, flowers here. So those are kind of unusual shots and fortunate to get those. 
So the other thing I wanted to point out before moving on is, you know, we're very lucky along the Oregon coast here to have so many peregrine falcons, uh, but they actually also um, have adapted to living in cities and on structures. Um, and along the Oregon coast, they are using bridges. Now, this is the Waldport Bridge, a photo from Roy again. And they actually, who, who put this nest box up there? I'm not sure who put this up. Well, we'll text the uh, person who took the photo here. But anyway, uh, they, uh, you know, peregrine falcons aren't that picky. They went ahead and used this box that's underneath the Waldport Bridge. Also ask him how he got this picture. This is under the bridge. He, okay. Okay, I don't know if you could hear that, but uh, Roy dropped a camera on a, off on a pole to get these pictures just for you folks here tonight. ODOT put that, that uh, box there. That was, that's a great idea. Here's those falcons a little bit uh, grown up, ready to fledge. Isn't that cute? Okay, so the last falcon we'll take a quick look at here. That's the kestrel. And, you know, we don't have a lot of kestrels on our part of the coast because this is a bird of open areas up there in Tillamook County. There are a lot more in those open, using those open fields. So that's a very small falcon. Okay, so let's see what we got here. This is not a turkey vulture. This is a Rupel's griffin. Um, looks like it's been doing some dining. Uh, some more shots. Here's um, these are from Africa, and this is the lappet face vulture. And the reason I included these shots is because I really like them, but also because I wanted to let you know that. Our vultures are not related to these old world vultures. Okay, it's kind of like the thing with the parrot and the falcon. Now, this is it. This may be equally surprising to you. Our turkey vulture is more closely related to this bird than this bird. Okay, this is a stork, and this is a little bit controversial. I understand it's a little bit. This is still being sorted out, but it seems that our turkey vulture is more closely related to storks. Yeah, I know it's weird. Okay, so here's a couple turkey vultures. Folks are probably familiar with them. They have the red head and dark body. Uh, these shots here were taken from our yard, and um, this may or may not be a roadkill in our yard that was put there to draw in the vultures for observation. I just I can't remember the circumstances. Here's one with a raccoon. We love vultures here. Uh, they're a little bit of an underappreciated species. Here's one spreading its wings. You can see they're all dark on, on the upper and lower parts. Now there's that old uh, poem, The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe that talks about the eye of the vulture, the, or the, the the, the proprietor of the um, featured person had a vulture eye, which he could not abide, the vulture eye. So here's that eye that drove the guy crazy to commit murder. Just thought I'd throw that in for fun. Yeah. Okay, so we had a great experience here in our yard in Toledo, Oregon, back in, what was this, uh, 2014. We had some researchers from Coastal Raptors and OSU. Um, doing uh taking part in a, a study in our yard and these uh shots here are taken from a a game cam uh we brought in that deer and they're checking that out and here's a shot of uh, some of the vultures fighting around the, the uh, carcass there but uh back when i was a kid back in uh, 1985 um my favorite program was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And they, on that show, I don't know if some of you have seen that, but it was it was always, I just love it. They had the rocket net. They'd, they'd boom, and the net would fly up in the air and catch whatever they wanted to study. So we got to do that right here in our yard. Here we go. There's the, um, the net explosion. Net flies up, captures a vulture. There I am uh, securing the bird. And there's a shot of the researcher. Uh, with the bird taking it out the net. Okay, so this was part of a study that um, 
was to determine the uh, feasibility of releasing California condors along the Oregon coast. So basically the turkey vultures are being used as a surrogate to uh, determine mercury and lead levels um, to see if there's elevated uh, toxins along the coast here and whether the coast would actually be suitable for the California condors to be reintroduced. Um, so my understanding of the results of that study are that along the coast we do have very elevated levels of uh, mercury in particular. 60% uh, of the vultures along the coast have uh, levels of mercury that threaten their health and 13% uh, have mercury levels that would interfere with breeding. So that's a problem. Um, correlating that to uh, speculating the success of condors in this area. So, um, and, and, and okay, so condors are even more uh, susceptible to those um, toxins than our turkey vultures. So uh, my understanding is the lead levels were similar on the coast to inland areas, okay? So this particular I'm holding is EP, that's the, the uh, um, Tag that this bird gets on its wings. I'll show you that in a second. Here we're just doing some measurements, but there you go, EP. And this is our boy. This uh, raptor has come back to our yard every year since 2014, and it's great. It's like EP's back, so it's wonderful. Uh, the other ones uh, haven't showed up really that much, but this is also a study showing their sight fidelity, and uh, this shows this one's coming right back to our yard. It is a nice yard, yeah, um, but. Uh, EP. Okay, okay, we got that. Um, so what I also want to share with you is every year this bird uh, spends its winters down in the Sacramento area. So that's what's going on there. So other birds that were uh, tagged in our yard go to Mexico. This particular individual seems to prefer Sacramento. So here you see the uh, pale underwings. On the turkey vulture, they have that all the dark plumage except those flight feathers on the underside are lighter. The other thing I want to point out is that turkey vultures uh, hold their wings in a dihedral formation. They're uh, angled up. Now, Don, you, you got me on this once. You said, what does dihedral mean? And I said, I don't know what it means. That's just the word I use to describe turkey vulture wings. So you said, why do you use it if it doesn't? mean anything. You don't know what it means. It's only referring to a turkey vulture. I said, that's a good point. I'll stop using it. But the truth is, is that this dihedral formation is also found on this last raptor that we're going to look at. And that's the marsh hawk. You see, uh, th these two are the, the two species that hold their wings up at that angle. And you can see that pretty well in that shot of the, the marsh hawk there. So this is a species that uh, you, you do see these around Etarts Bay, and they're told by that, uh, that formation that they hold their wings in, but also that very long tail. Check out that tail, very long, but even better than that, whew, the white on that rump. I'm telling you. Oh, did I say marsh hawk? Uh, they, they understand. It's Northern Harrier used to be called marsh hawk. So anyway, this bird has a couple different plumages. Uh, the younger birds and females have this brown coloration. And then the um, adult males have a more of a, a silver and white uh, coloration. But in either plumage, whatever you see that white on the rump, and that's a mic. Don't have to white rump. Northern Harrier. Okay, just to review before we move on to owls, the shape on the top, which that one? That, that's the Budio. Some people say Budio. The next one is a wait, I gotta review the Budio here. It's got a short tail, heavy body, broad wings. And then the next one, the one in the center is the occipiter. It also has short, broad wings, but it has a very long tail. Falcon. And then the last one is the falcon or parrot. They have the long tapered wings and a long tail. So this is a great horned owl that was in our yard. And uh, they're the largest owl in our area and they're quite common. 
Um, they're easier to photograph in Eastern Oregon where you get them out in the open like this. Okay, uh, at Mall Here Refuge is a great place to photograph them. And here's one on a, a power line. But yeah, we're, I'll move through these quickly here. This is a barn owl. Um, now these uh, like open areas, so and they, they do nest in barns. So up in the barns around Tillamook County there, these are fairly common. Now, interesting thing about the barn owl, they're extremely short lived. And I didn't realize this, but the average life expectancy for a barn owl is only once. Are you kidding me? So uh, a huge percentage of them, like the mortality in the first year is, I, I can't, I'm trying to remember, it's like 70%. Very few of them even breed more than once. Is that a rough deal or what? Okay, so they do have a lot of chicks. And, you know, in my neighborhood here, I'm known as the bird guy. So some folks with a barn nearby called me in to rescue this fluffy little chick that had fallen off the rafters of their barn. So I went with the heavy welding gloves and uh, climbed up and put it back in its nest. So finishing up here, this is a barred owl in our backyard. And this is the species that, um, uh, you know, there's some controversy surrounding it because it has become much more common in our area in recent years as its range has expanded due to forest fragmentation. It's closely related to the spotted owl and it does breed with that a more rare species of the old growth forest leading to hybrids. So that's a, a bit of an issue, but the barred owl in its own right is a spectacular species. And it's called? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and this uh, will finish up the program here with uh, this painting I did of the saw wet owl, which is a favorite of mine. It's a very diminutive owl. Uh, found it's throughout our area, not particularly common. Here is a very rare example of a friend in the area had one using a nest box, which is unusual for this species. This was just last year. Um, so that was a, a, a real treat seeing it. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm finishing up with the brood patch. Here. Are you kidding me? How cute is that? A brood patch on an owl? So, yeah, we got it right on the screen here. Here's the brood patch, look at that. They can see have for tonight. So thank you all so much for joining us and these wonderful birds. Okay. That, that was great, Ram, thank you. Thanks. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, so we do have some questions that popped up uh, here in the comments and you can uh, you can see some of them cycling in your, for yourself too, but I'm gonna scan up. Um, I appreciated you talking about the uh, salmonella issue because we actually had some people asking us questions about that online. And so uh, one thing that came up was um, a discussion about can the Sharpies themselves get salmonella? I don't know if you addressed that in your presentation. If you did, sorry for making you repeat it, but it did come back up. No, I didn't. I didn't mention that. the The question was about whether here I'm going to take this thing off here. Uh, whether sharp shin hawk. I I haven't heard of that, but I don't see um, why that wouldn't be a possibility if they're feeding on uh, birds with. Uh, with salmonella, like pine siskins in particularly in our area, a lot of pine siskins have salmonella in that uh, th this year in particular, and that is a, a favorite uh, prey item of the sharp shin hawk. I haven't uh, heard of uh, uh, a Sharpie uh, getting salmonella, but I don't see why that couldn't happen. All right, well, thanks for answering that because I thought it was an interesting, interesting little, interesting discussion that was happening. Um, so another question that came in from Veronica mm -hmm. was how big of a prey can bald eagles catch? Uh, quite large. I think that um, they could take a great blue heron. Yeah. Impressive. And um, peregrine falcons can take western gulls. 
So they, they can also take very large birds for the peregrine. That bird exceeds its, uh, its own body size. So I have seen, um, eagles attack great blue herons. Uh, they very frequently attack ducks, um, uh, in Neatarts Bay there. So let's see. Bald eagles get along, uh, coexist with ospreys. Yeah, they, uh, th that's the question is, uh, can bald eagles get along and, and coexist with ospreys? They, I haven't personally observed. Uh, so the answer is yes. That doesn't seem to be a big area of conflict. So um, mm -hmm. do they steal from the osprey? So um, among all these raptors, there's kind of a pecking order. Certain uh, birds of prey steal food from other birds of prey. And, uh, you know, the uh, osprey, let's just say, is a more skilled hunter than the bald eagle. So the bald eagle will occasionally steal the fish uh, from an osprey. And uh, that's another one people like to tell you about, don't they? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's really entertaining for some people. Okay. What backyard treats? Um, uh, if you're talking about, if you're talking about sharp shinned hawks, they seem to have a preference for pine siskins. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I've never met a turkey vulture that didn't enjoy a good road killed deer. And, uh, let's face it. One deer goes a long way. Uh, and there are a lot of them out there on the roadway. It's not that I'd advocate that. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. So uh, for feeding songbirds, we offer black oil, sunflower seeds, sunflower hearts, millet. Those are the three things. And suet and um, crack corn and millet. Yeah, I'm, okay. Yeah, we, we offer all those things and then hummingbird feeders with uh, sugar water as well. So that, all those things are good to, to offer. What else we got here for questions? Oh, yeah, so the uh, so the 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 call of the um, someone's asking about a different owl call, the typical who who call. That's from the great horned owl. <laughs> so the mnemonic to remember that is, who's up? Who's awake? Who's awake? Yeah. Me too. Who's awake? Me too. And it has that hoot owl sound to it so uh that's that's probably what you're hearing there who's awake i thought it was who's that's it she's got it i just specialize in barred <laughs> owls myself a little more dramatic yeah who's awake me too and it's that classic who hoot sound okay so what else we got here for questions we had somebody asked, do bald eagles work as team in a team um mm -hmm. we've seen two chases yeah. single goal Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. Yeah. The, you see them uh, working together in various contexts to, to corral their prey. So that's definitely a yes. Oh yeah. We got a suggestion um, that uh, turkey vultures enjoy a good fish carcass as well. So we won't limit it to, to mammals in this case. So turkey vultures are a little bit skittish, even if you have a snack out for them. So those pictures were taken from a blind actually that I set up. Well, one just came in. Do raptors mate for life? Do raptors mate for life? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> they are monogamous. Uh, they can be described as monogamous during the season. So they do form uh, a pair bond uh, seasonally. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you what I told you about the folks at Yaquinahead. They're always talking about you know, it's like a soap opera there. This uh, falcon seems to be moving in and going off with some other falcon and they keep track of this and they're always gossiping about the uh, romantic life of the falcons up there. So they're, um, yeah, they're monogamous on a yearly basis. So they tend to mate with the same individual year to year, but not like some species uh, of birds that mate for life. That's my understanding. Awesome. That's awesome. I did have a question here privately about juvenile bald eagles. I don't think it's mm -hmm. on your feed. Um, mm -hmm. So somebody's seen a lot of juvenile bald eagles uh, hunting, eating together. And does that change as they get older? 
You know, I, I've observed that too. And um, it does seem like uh, the juvenile bald eagles uh, forage together more often than the adults do. Uh, that's so I just make the same observation. I don't have a additional um, knowledge on that. That's just something I've observed also. Okay. Favorite raptor and the only <laughs> correct answer <laughs> you see it. <laughs> Favorite raptor. Uh, this this uh, individual here is uh, partial to northern goshawk. Goshawk's a great choice, yeah. We can do top I'll two. Go, I'll, I'll go with harpy <laughs> eagle. Okay. <laughs> it's easy. Come on. It's the epitome. It's the, <laughs> the bird of prey of birds of prey. It's the... Uh, the biggest and most of everything. So <laughs> a very spectacular species of the new world tropics. Well, Shelly has posted a question. Do the names sharp shinned and rough legged have anything to do with their legs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, as a lot of you probably have heard that most birds were named um, by uh, explorers, uh, uh, early ornithologist that shot the birds and then looked at them in their hand. So when you're holding the, the Sharpie in your hand there, it's noticeable that the, the, uh, the shins do have a sharper edge on them is my understanding. And then for the rough legged Hawk uh, that's referring to the feathering that extends down on the thigh uh, of, of that species. So they have a lot of feathering coming down onto the leg there. And no, it's, you know, it's not particularly remarkable. It's not something that you would think to name that bird unless you had it in your hands with its rough legs right in front of you there. So that's how those, those uh, species got those names. This recording will be posted online. You can find our virtual library on our website, kneetartsbaywebs.org. Um, it's a great place to see our presentations that we've had up so far. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob everybody. And really appreciate the great turnout. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming and joining us this evening.